who called this man a king. Strength is what comes out on top. Rome is what comes out on top. Have you ever seen such a silent weakling dragging along his cross with dejected acceptance? Has he no will to live even? Put him up there already. These people are pathetic and dirty and witless. They gripe about their independence and don't see how superior we are, how this is the necessary order of things, the strong ruling the weak, everything in its right place. in his sovereignty has stripped this imposter of his claims. This Jesus is laid bare. His grandiose promises are empty. The right place for a crown of thorns on that liar's brow. A king among our people? Laughable. The son of God? heretical. Now, things can return to normal. The sacred things, all under our supervision again. His life ebbing as the setting sun. All mortals have an end. See his mortality but tomorrow will dawn without his upside down teachings, foolish disciples, and troublesome crowds. Order again, everything in its right place. walls fallen in? Has the sun dropped from the sky? All that I have known is unknown now, and every hope of mine is buried. Was I deceived? Did I myself deceive? Didn't I see him heal? Didn't my heart leap at his every word? Why beat the one who heals? And why accuse the one who's blameless? Surely God has forsaken us and wa finally washed his hands, for nothing is right. The God of the universe bending to the will of man, bowing and bleeding, never to rise again, everything in its right place. Everything. blood spills out like the perfume I poured out 
nothing was too costly for my Lord. And this is costing him everything. Didn't he say, in pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial? Falling to the earth, crimson drops, like tears, the kind that pour and sting and heal. If he was in the beginning and will be without end, doesn't he have the power to stop all of this? What I see with my eyes is not all that is true. God, in all his mercy, must have a plan even now. Could it be possible that he's choosing death? Why would he suffer if not for love? Everything in its right place. Everything. fully man and yet fully God. Jesus, the Messiah, was crucified. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us.
in that song what you went through to love me I'll never fully understand and tonight for a few moments we're going to try to understand with the finite mind and our human condition and existence that our hearts and deeper than that our souls might understand the way that we've been loved because Jesus makes statements throughout scripture that honestly like the song's title that we're blown away we can't even understand and one statement he tells his disciples, he says, there is no greater love than when a person is willing to lay their life down for their friends. And then he follows true to his words. In the end verse in that song, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthaniya, it's Aramaic. Jesus says this from the cross. And he says this and it's from Psalm 22, he's quoting David. He's bringing in the heartache of the human condition that David was sharing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you left me here to die on this cross? Are you nowhere to be found? Jesus in all of his divinity is caught in all of his humanity in this moment of the crossroads of the precipice of the inflection moment where heaven and earth are colliding and he is on the cross to reconcile and redeem all of us. And if you've ever wondered, can God feel my pain? Have you ever been curious if God understands what it means to feel forsaken, forgotten, to be beaten down, spit upon, pushed to the wayside, marginalized, ostracized and kicked to the end? And he has. And so tonight, we want to take just a few moments and we want to do something to actually try to understand for a moment the way that he loved us was a way that he was so willing to sacrifice so much for you and for I. And it's hard for our hearts to fully fathom, but I pray and the Holy Spirit would move in this place that we would understand even a little bit 
of a whole lot of it, of how he loved us. And in Hebrews, the author says that Jesus, chapter 12, that, that because of the cross set before him, which we're going to talk about, that cross set before him, he considered it joy, that he considered it joy to go to that cross. Why? Why on earth would anyone equate that to joy? Because he knew that it meant freedom and redemption and to make you and I family for all of us that call Jesus Christ our Savior and that we put our faith in him. And he turned his eyes to the cross for you and I. And tonight I want us to turn our eyes, not just to the cross, but to Jesus. And I want you to listen to these words and begin to resonate on them as we focus and as we put ourselves at the epicenter of his person, the Messiah, the Son of God named Jesus tonight, that we would turn our eyes and our hearts and our mind and our souls toward Jesus. And we begin to think and realize and fathom and try to understand the way that he loved us. And we turn our eyes toward him. pray that you somehow, that we could take a few moments to understand the magnitude of the moments that you hung on the cross, that somehow we would gather why it's called Good Friday, because of the hope that was being brought through the greatest pain we could possibly imagine. And Jesus, I just, I pray tonight that you, you, your name, Jesus Christ, son of the living God, from a small town, Nazareth. But Bethlehem, that we'd understand who you are and what you did for us. May you bless our time together. Jesus, we ask. Amen. It is probably more often that we should take moments as we are now to understand this guy named Jesus. Because it seems to be this turning point in history even the way that we mark our calendars, fall around that cross. If you've ever given the weight and consideration to that. If you've ever stopped and considered the breadth and the depth of this person named Jesus, who so much of history revolves around. Whether people want it to or not, it just, it does. And it makes you question and begin to try to fathom, is Jesus really the Son of God? And if he is, did he really love me in a way that I could never possibly imagine? And did he love me in such a way that he sacrificed so greatly that you and I would not have to have that kind of sacrifice in our life? The life of Jesus is pretty incredible. It's intentional. It was interruptible. You could stop him. He would see you. He'd understand you. It was full of purpose and love. The words of Jesus, people would say, had great authority. They had depth to them. He would speak and they'd say, we've never heard a person speak that way before. We've never heard anyone teach with the authority that he does. It, it, it pierced them to their hearts and soul. We've never saw anything like this, the works that he has done. Like when John the Baptist said, is, 
this the Messiah or is there another? And Jesus sends back testimony of it. He said, no, the deaf are hearing, the blind are given sight, the lame they can walk, those that have leprosy have been healed. Forgiveness of sins is being preached. He, he said, the good news is out there. You tell John that. Jesus was unbelievable with the way that he would move. There's a recorded in scripture that he moves through this crowded city looking for a man named Jairus and his daughter and a woman who had a blood disorder for 12 years was plagued and somebody touched his cloak and he said, who did that? And the disciples are like, are you kidding me? It's packed all around us. Who knows who did that? But he, he considered to stop in his way to get in our way. He was an intentional person. He was interruptible. You could talk to him, be with him. And we bring ourselves today, millions and mil hundreds of millions across this planet today are observing and stopping for this idea called Good Friday. And it doesn't seem good the more we talk about it to understand what took place on that cross. And a week earlier, pretty much, building up to this point where he would be resurrected and that we would see him, what we're going to celebrate on Easter, is Palm Sunday. And he comes in and literally a quarter million plus people are shouting and they're yelling things like, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest, our Savior, he's here. And they were thinking he was going to change everything. And the week goes on and he has his last supper. He sits with his disciples. Even one of them, it's recorded that they leaned back upon him in that moment. And he's telling him these things that I'm going to have to suffer and they don't understand. They don't quite get it. And Jesus is bringing to this point where all of a sudden he is now arrested, arraigned, tried, and an execution and sentence is delivered out all in this matter of 24 hours. And Good Friday seems like the worst Friday you could ever possibly imagine in your life. And to give this the gravitas, the understanding, is to understand the Romans would have taken this cross, this instrument of execution, and it would have been brutal. It would have been done in public. But this was not the first thing to happen to him. He would have been whipped 39 times, unrecognizable as a human being, whipped over and over, brought around a stone in a public square, hands tied, wrists bound, unable to move, tears probably coming down his face, heart broken, feeling abandoned, flesh ripping open, organs being shown. This Jesus who was just celebrated Hosanna, our Savior, to crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate and Herod, who weren't even friends, come together in course and try to pass it back off. And they yell for Barabbas, who is a murderer, who is a conspirator. And, and, and they exchange it for Jesus, who Pilate said, I can find no fault. I wash my hands of this individual. And yet his own people call for his death in the most brutal way. Then they drag him, they put a robe around him, and they mock him, and they put a crown of thrones upon him, and they push it on. These thorns are piercing into his skin, through every epidural layer he has, into his skull, hitting nerve endings, excruciating pain. He probably can't even speak, and they mock him, and then they ask him to carry his cross that he will be tortured with and killed upon, and they ask him to carry this. Via de la Rosa, this pathway of suffering. And he's coming down this way, and it's like after you run a marathon, somebody says, by the way, can you grab this three or 400 pound cross, maybe even heavier, and will you carry this? And he's doing this in Hebrews, the author says, he considered that the joy for you and I. He considered that would be joy. He was doing that. There was a joy in his heart. If you can even understand it, I can't. I've tried, I've prayed about it, I, I've read scripture on it, and I don't fathom it. And they go to Golgotha, which would be Calvary, because the hill looked like a skull. And the Romans knew that, and they saw the imagery, and they exploited it, and they put it on full display for everyone to see. And they're bringing him there, and they're going to put him on this cross, and they're going to mock him, and they're going to gamble for his clothing, and they're going to publicly humiliate him. He's going to be pretty much naked upon this cross unrecognizable, blood coming out, tears flowing out, mocked, despised, ridiculed. 
And now you can imagine, though it looks beautiful, the lighting in this place is beautiful. The arts team have done magnificent work in here. But if you could just imagine if your eyes were closed, there is blood staining this wood. There is pools of blood. There is his mother nearby. Tears flowing down her eyes. His disciples are nowhere to be found. They are scared to death. Peter has denied him, though he said he would give his life for him. He is nowhere to be found at all. He is gone. He is alone on this cross. And it gives weight to the author Isaiah, who hundreds of years earlier depicted and declared and prophesied what would happen. How is that even possible? Because maybe this really is the Son of God. So surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all. In spite of us doing whatever we want, carry on however we will, God says, I want to put all the pain and all the sin of humanity upon my son. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears silent, so he did not open his mouth. Can you imagine if somebody's dragging you away, pulling you away for an unwarranted, wrongful death, wrongfully accused, wrongfully tried, no acquittal on the way at all, and yet you open your mouth, not at all, knowing you could, but you don't. And not only the physical suffering, but the physical and the emotional and the spiritual separation. If you have a child or you have a grandchild or you love kids and you care for them, if you've ever had a small one and they're crying in the middle of the night, it comes a point where you can't handle it. And I don't mean the tears. You can't handle it in your heart. You get up because you want to comfort them. Or when you have a child and they're hurt and they're hurt badly. Maybe they're at the doctor, they're at the hospital. You want to go comfort them and nothing's going to stop you. No security guard, no anything. Right? You're there. And this pain of Jesus feeling like, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? Where are you, Dad? I need you, Dad. I'm hurting. I'm all alone. They all left. And I'm, I'm bleeding bad. And I really need you. I really need you bad. And nothing. And the iniquity and the weight of everything is upon him. And so you find this Jesus who loves us, who came to seek and save the lost. He is there on what seems to be a horrible Friday, fully separated, but it picks up in the story. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke picks up and records in chapter 23. And he takes us to the cross. He takes us up to the moment that I've described now. Everything that's being fulfilled, Isaiah said what happened has happened. Every bit of pain and torture and gruesome thing you can imagine has happened. Every part of you in a visceral way that would have had to look away because you couldn't even stomach what you saw was happening and happened. And to top it off, mocking and gambling of his clothes, ridiculing him. Luke says two other men were on either side of this cross. Both criminals were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, that would be Golgotha, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the others on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not, they do not know, what they are doing. Can you even imagine that? That in all that, he says, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea who I am, God. Don't, don't, don't punish them. Keep the iniquity on me. God, they don't even understand what's happening. It's so hard, forgiveness, when somebody wrongs you. He's been wrongfully put there, wrongfully set upon the cross. It was the wrong person and the wrong time to do that. He should, they never should have done that, but they've done that. And now they're asking for forgiveness. Have you ever had to forgive somebody 
Because Jesus makes statements that says, and forgive us our debts. He teaches his disciples how to pray. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. He says this verse in the Lord's Prayer. And I stop and I consider Jesus says, love your enemies. What? Love them. Don't hate them. Be kind to those that persecute you. Put your money where your mouth is, Jesus. He is right now. He's asking when a criminal on the left and a criminal on the right who were wrongfully accused, nope, not at all. They were murderers. They were cheaters. They were thieves. They, they deserved to be there. There was no way that they were wrongfully put there. They weren't even in the same category or camp as Jesus. They were not around putting water into wine, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, healing those with leprosy. They weren't doing any of that. They were stealing, taking advantage of the blind, advantage of the deaf. They they were doing everything opposite of what Jesus was doing, yet they're upon there right now. And he looks them to the left and the right and the soldiers that have gambled his clothes, those that have mocked him, those that have nailed and put stakes, pretty much oversized nails, through his wrist, through through the bone, through the tendon, hitting the nerves all the way through. He's saying, forgive them. When somebody begs you for forgiveness and says, I'm sorry I hurt you, I'm sorry I wronged you, even you and I have had moments, have we not, we we don't grant forgiveness. We're like, I'm never going to forgive them. I'm never going to forget what they did. I will never let it go. And Jesus is making right every wrong that had ever taken place, that was taking place, that would take place. He's making it right on the cross in that moment. And he's saying, Father, I'm here for a purpose. Man, I was sweating Blood, literally, in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying if a cup would pass, let it pass, but it would not. Nobody understands. They've all left, but I'm here. God, let it fall on me and forgive them for what they don't even understand. They don't know who I am yet, but they will. And Luke is capturing this. And he goes on, he says this, he says, the people stood watching and the rulers even snared at him. He said, he saved others, let him save himself. Can you imagine saying that to somebody bleeding out on a cross that you knew darn well didn't belong there? Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar, which you would have spit out if you would have ingested, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. Here's the one. Here's your savior that you were chanting about, Hosanna. That's the one that wrote in, and I know there are hundreds of thousands of you, but no one's to be found now. The disciples are gone. Everybody is left. Save yourself. And the religious rulers, save yourself. And the soldiers, come on now, right? They're, they're all antagonizing him and pushing him. And what is he doing? Father, forgive them. And I stop and I just try to consider for a moment this. And one of the criminals on the cross, one of these criminals who hung there, hurled insults at him. He's so angry at the cusp of his own death, his own demise, I mean, his own demonic version of life that he has just gone down the drain with and done horrible, deplorable, despicable things. And he's looking over to Jesus who is praying for him in real time, praying for everybody around him, asking God for forgiveness for all those that have put him there. And this one says, are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Do it. Save yourself. Save yourself and us. Come on, save us too. And he was full of just guile and mockery. And Jesus had great empathy. Romans captures this and he says in this moment, he says, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet like that guy on the cross, mocking Jesus, saying, I don't need God, I don't need help, I don't need anything at all. God said he died for us. And at the perfect time, And that's how God works. The perfect time when you feel helpless and you're strung to a cross and you don't know what to do, Jesus Christ is thinking about you, praying for you, loving you, and offering forgiveness and redemption and joy and peace and love for you for the suffering that he took. He took on the suffering and considered it joy set before him for you and I. 
And while we were yet sinners, while we yet had missed the mark and were lost and had nowhere to turn, Jesus Christ was thinking of you and I. And somehow this other criminal on the cross that Jesus didn't see as a criminal, he saw as a lost son. He says this, Luke records, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. He said, we're getting what we deserve, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, in fact. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you've got to imagine this moment. This moment is the whole reason Jesus goes to the cross. This person beside him can offer no way to follow Jesus. He can't give anything to Jesus. He can't do anything for Jesus. He can't fulfill some religious work. He can't show up to church. He can't tithe. He can't serve. He can't help at all. There's no good work. There's nothing left for him to do. His time is so limited. And he's begging for mercy. One mocks him and the other asks for mercy because he recognizes him for who he is. He sees him, even like this centurion when Jesus dies, says, surely, wait a minute, this was the son of God. We had this wrong. Guys, fellas, we had it wrong. We missed it. And Jesus responds. David, David said, this is who my Savior is. Where does my help come from? I look up to the hills. God, you are unfailing love. In Psalm 51, you are full of mercy, full of grace, full of love, full of redemption. My story is not over with you, Jesus. And when I've failed and I've, and I've messed up and everybody has forgotten me and I sit there and my life feels like it is depicted upon a lonely criminal on a cross that nobody cares for, nobody wants anything to do with and everyone else mocks you, God, and my heart is crying out to you. My heart is saying that you're real and there's something true about you. And maybe I would say that even tonight that you're here and the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart and you're saying, I know there's something more significant about Jesus and I've never fully trusted him. I never asked him for mercy when you look upon this and think about what this criminal says, and Jesus replies and answers, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus looks over to him and he says, truly I tell you, he says, you'll be with me in paradise. Can you imagine that moment, knowing that it's the Son of God? You're asking for mercy and none has been given you. You know you're wrong and you can't make it right. You feel completely forgotten, but you are being seen by one. And the one that matters more than anyone else. The one that, if it is true, the Messiah, the Son of God, that created all that we see. That scripture says all things come from him, to him, and through him. He is the giver of life. He is the giver of redemption. He is the giver and author of our faith. He is the one that has the ability to finish it, the Hebrew says. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one that has started our story that might have felt pricked in your heart. They begin to follow Jesus, and when you feel like giving up, he says, don't give up yet. You're going to be with me in paradise one day. I see you, and I love you, and I have not forgotten about you. And even in my anguish, in my pain, in my suffering, unjustly though it may be, I am for you, even now. And if nobody else is for you, and the world's against you and the world is on my shoulders. I'm with you. Can you imagine Jesus is saying this to this man? He's experiencing mercy. The one that mocked him is probably thinking, oh my gosh. And there is a gravitas and a sense of realism and a spiritual power and authority that is like never been felt ever. And the Son of God is on there like an innocent lamb being led to the shears, not opening his mouth, and the only time he opens his mouth is not to defend himself, but to save you and I. And I can't imagine. I feel like we should teach about this more to understand the way he loved us. And I wish, can you imagine if you could talk to the criminal that Jesus said, that's my son, don't call him a criminal. But he did despicable things, he says, but my divine nature has healed him. It will make him whole again. But he is horrible with a hard heart, but my softness and my gentleness and my love and my spirit will soften his heart. He's my lost son who I came to seek and save, and that's what Jesus is all about. And can you imagine if you and I could talk to him for a moment, what he would tell us? 
I imagine that if we could stop for a moment, if we could transcend in this moment and go back in time, and we could talk to him and said, what was that moment like? Even as you faced death, but you felt the great security of your Savior, Jesus Christ, can you tell us what was going through your mind and your heart? What was happening on Good Friday for you as you experienced the mercy of Jesus Christ? I think that it would sound maybe something like this. The soldiers drove us forward with their whips and insults. I found myself walking with other condemned criminals. The weight of the rough hewn beam cutting into my back as I took each laborious step. It felt like forever, and my sleep-deprived, half-crazed mind began to reflect on my life. In reality, I'd wasted it. My dark heart took what wasn't mine. Stealing led to murder, and murder brought me here. The man beside me fell. The exhaustion, the dehydration, the torture had taken its toll. They were on him like a pack of wild dogs, cursing him, beating him. And when it was clear he could no longer continue, they went in search of some bystander that could help him with his cross. It was then that our eyes met. Beyond the agony in his eyes, there was something deeper, kindness, sympathy. I now knew who this other prisoner was, the Nazarene, the man who claimed to be the son of God. Perhaps he could save me. I remembered his name and almost unconsciously whispered it. Jesus. The first time I saw him, the soldiers were bringing him from the governor's palace. The blood that trailed behind him, it was so much. Here he was being held in the heartless grip of two soldiers being led to his final demise. He showed no anger, no hatred, no disdain for those who so cruelly held him in his final hours on this earth. They placed the heavy wooden cross on his shoulders. And it was odd. It almost seemed as if he embraced the cross with some sense of purpose. The last few steps to the top of Golgotha are the most agonizing. A most painful death was just moments away. They raised me up, naked, ashamed, and alone to face the punishment that I deserved. And there next to me was Jesus. There he was, facing the same pain, the same shame, but he didn't deserve it. I managed to turn and look at him. The wounds and cuts made by the soldier's whips so clearly showed the hatred they had for him. A voice from my childhood days in the synagogue echoed in my mind. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. They were the words of Isaiah so long ago. This man next to me could be the one that Isaiah had written about. He could save me. Would he save me? A thief hanging on the other side of Jesus began to shout, screaming and cursing at him, telling Jesus that he was nothing, that he was a dying fool. I could not stay silent. Quiet! Don't you know that this man is innocent? We deserve this. He does not. Keep your mouth shut and speak against this man no more. I felt Jesus looking at me. Those eyes. I turned and looked at him. deep pools of compassion and love. I gathered enough strength to speak. Lord, will you remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. Today, he said, you will be with me in paradise. Not long after that, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, it is finished and breathed his last. He was gone. I knew in my heart there was peace beyond the pain and a hope that death would not be the end. With one last painful gasp of air, I felt my body give way and my spirit was detached from its earthly dwelling. All sense of time and mortality fled like darkness flees from the light of dawn. Suddenly, a hand reached for mine, a hand that I recognized. I grabbed that hand and I will never let go. Can you imagine your life as the criminal, which is actually a son, who sits with Jesus now? For those of us who are faith, brings us to that point to be absent from our body is to be present with our Lord. That Jesus was not a liar. He was not a lunatic. He was the Lord. And that when he said, he met, and he had the power to fulfill. And today you'll be in paradise with me. And of all the agony and the pain on that cross, there was so much hope. So much hope for you and I. And wherever you and I are today, maybe on our journey as we reflect, we've been following Jesus for a long time and our hearts and our souls feel the gravity of what he did for us. And when he says there is no greater love than somebody lay their life down, we saw the way he laid it down for us. But we know he raised it again because he was full of power and love and mercy for you and I. And for some of us that have lost track or sight, we haven't turned our eyes toward Jesus. Maybe we've never turned our eyes toward Jesus. But God is prompting you and he's calling you in this gentle voice and you don't realize he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same Jesus and Savior that would look to you in your greatest moment of embarrassment or pain and difficulty and he would look to you and he would say, you know what? I love you. And I want to take us in this moment where we as a community gather for communion. That we would commune not in just the sacrament that has been given to us as a church, which is beautiful, but in a sacred, spiritual, supernatural moment. That our hearts and our souls, that the Holy Spirit would move us to understand what Jesus had gone through for you and I. Do you understand if you were on that cross, he would have done that for you. He did that for you. And as they pass the elements even now, as you take these elements, I'm going to encourage you to hold them. Once the elements are fully passed, we'll take them together as a community. And we'll read from 1 Corinthians as Paul reflects that night that Jesus sat there with his disciples and he described the suffering that you and I just heard about in Scripture talked about and witnessed through video. That we hold these elements and we begin to understand that body that was completely broken, bones and ribs, bones in his arms and his ankles, beaten and bloody for you and I. But somehow if we could do this today, as these elements pass, what if we turned our eyes as you hold these and you resonate what if you closed your eyes and you maybe even fixed your eyes on that cross? And you said, Jesus, let me see you again. Let me see you in all your glory. Let me see you in all your pain. Let me see you for the Savior you are. Let me see you that you call me son and daughter as you did that criminal. Let me see you afresh. God, will you rekindle my heart? As I read through Scripture and I read these things, my heart felt humbled. Because I can't say I would ever do that for somebody else the way he did that for me and for you. Listen to the words in the song. Look at that cross. Look into your heart and soul. 
let everything inside of you turn toward this person named Jesus. There's nobody greater than I know that can create a better, beautiful life and story than he can in yours and mine in our life. Listen to these words. feel humbled like I haven't in a long time. And uh, I've been asking myself, I need to do this more often and just reread and re-understand and not just reflect, but have it renew my soul for who Jesus is. I still have no idea how he considered that the joy of that cross for you and I, but he did. And so Paul, he instructs us as a community of believers, not not perfect people, not religious people, people that are like that criminal, just just like that criminal, that are calling upon our Savior for mercy. And Paul says, there's nothing like it when you call out for mercy and you're given mercy. You can't even imagine. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, for I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. I do this in remembrance of me. So I take this body. It was broken for you and I take this with me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And do this, and whatever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whatever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes for paradise. And until that day, let us be a community that calls upon the mercy and blood of Jesus to restore and renew our souls. We do this in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I ask now as we... We stop and I feel like the only right thing for us to do is to to worship you, to acknowledge you, to sing to you, to pray to you. Jesus, I ask that you you move our hearts. God, as we come together, as Joyce and TJ come up and, and lead us, that we sing, God, that maybe we sing to a new Savior that we see in a new way that we have not seen in a long time. Maybe some of us for a, that we've never seen you like this, Jesus, but you are our Savior. You offer mercy to us. You grant mercy so freely. I pray, God, that you uh, you renew our hearts and our souls, that you set a fire inside of us to love you the way you've loved us. May you do this in your mighty name, and we all said, amen. I invite you to stand in this moment as our team leads us to sing to our Jesus.
If love endured that ancient cross How precious is my Savior's blood The beauty of heaven wrapped in my shade The image of love upon death's frame If heaven my heart was worth the pain What joy could you see beyond the grave If love found my soul would die chains are gone my dead is paid from death to tore through hell like a rose the promise that rolled back death and its stone if having my heart was worth the pain what joy could you see beyond So From death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. And from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see
Lift it up. You are worthy, Jesus. You are so awesome, so wonderful. All the earth and all the earth will shout your praise. What are they going to sing? one more time it's your breath it's your keep singing for you either. I can't, I can't do what they do. Gosh, I don't know about you, but I, I just, my heart feels humble and hopeful all at the same time. It's a weird feeling, man. It's, it's one that I feel like Jesus is doing in this place, in this community, and he's reminded us tonight the way that he loved us, that he laid his life down in a way we can't even imagine, but he lifted it up. And we're going to celebrate it on Easter, and I, I want to encourage you, man, be praying for Sunday, invite people, bring people, because we get to celebrate what he promised to that thief on that cross who he really said, you're not a criminal, you're my son, I love you, you'll be in paradise. He has the power to do things that we can't even imagine. And all he's asking is to reach out and say, I'll follow you, Jesus, even one step of faith at a time. Are you with me? I mean, I want to follow, I want to follow Jesus. So we, we love you. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for as a community together that we worship Jesus. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you Sunday.